with the scriptures. This is the in-depth study of the Hebrew alphabet. And we're going to start off with understanding why Yahweh says and how and, and Yeshua say, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. In Revelation, it says Alpha and Omega, but that's translated into Greek. So we are going to look at, we first, I always reference these scriptures, Isaiah 41 and 4, who has performed and done it, calling the generations from the beginning. I, Yahweh, am the first, and with the last, I am he. That's awesome right there. Isaiah 44 and 6. Thus says Yahweh, sovereign of Israel, and his redeemer, Yahweh of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no Elohim. Isaiah 48, 12, listen to me, O Yaakov and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first and I am also the last. Revelation 1 and one saying, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the first and the last, and write in a book what you see and send it to the seven assemblies of Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, and to Pergamos, and to Tyra, uh, Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laocasia. Revelation 1 and 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. And then finally, Revelation 22 and 13. I am the Aleph and the Tav. I am the beginning and the end, the first and the last. So we are going to moving on into our uh, next letter of the Hebrew alphabet is Resh. Everyone say, Reish. Reish. In this teaching, we're going to look at the characteristics of the Reish, the Gemetra value and its pictorial equivalent, how they relate to our Messiah, fulfilling him being the Aleph and the Tav throughout the Aleph bed. So now we have the Reish. It is the, uh, the 20th letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it has a gematria value of 200. So it's the 20th letter, and has a gematria of 200. Its pictorial equivalent is a man's head, and it literally means first, top, and beginning. So as I always do, I'm going to start with the number, with the gematria. And this letter is so special, not saying all the rest of them are, aren't, but it is so special in the, in the thought of who Yahweh is and who our Mashiach is and how it relates to us as the people set apart to him. This number, we're going to start with the first a hundred or the first 200 that we see in scripture. And that first 200 is in Genesis 11 and 23. And it says, and after he brought forth Nahor, Sarug lived 200 years and brought forth sons and daughters. So this is the first 200 that we see. And we see that now he brings forth sons and daughters. He was nah uh, Nahor's father, who was Terah's father, who was Abraham's father. So he is the great grandfather, or great, yes, great grandfather of Abraham. Right, or great great grandfather of Abraham. So his name, we're going to look at. This uh, name, Serug, Serug, and it's Brown Drivers Briggs Hebrew um, Dictionary and also Strong's H8286. And his name literally means branch, branch. And the root 
means to wrap together or be intertwined. Now this relates of course to our Messiah as he is called throughout scripture the branch of David. The branch of David. So now let's look at this branch and the Sarug, which is 8286. Now let's take it from Sarag, which is the root 8276. So as we look at that, let's look at some scriptures that give credence to this statement, um, Yeshua being called the branch of David. And we have uh, Jeremiah first, Jeremiah 23 and 5. Can we all read together? See, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I shall raise for David a branch of righteousness, and a sovereign shall reign and act wisely, and shall do right ruling and righteousness in the earth. Hallelujah. That branch of David, we're bringing out scriptures that refers to this branch. Next, Jeremiah 33 and 15, if you can read with me, please. In those days and at that time, I cause a branch of righteousness to spring forth for David, and he shall do right ruling and righteousness in the earth. This is this branch, the branch of David. Zechariah 3 and 8. Read together. Now listen, Yahushua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are men of symbol. For look, I am bringing forth my servant, hallelujah, the branch. Hallelujah. We're going to go on. And the last one is Zechariah 6 and 11. Let's read that all together. And you shall take the silver and gold, make a crown, and set it on the head of Yehoshua, the son of Yehoshadak, the high priest, and, and shall speak to him, saying, Thus said Yahweh of hosts, saying, See, the man whose name is the branch, and from his place, he shall branch out, and he shall build the hakel of Yahweh. I missed the last part. Of Yahweh, it says, and he shall build the hakel of Yahweh. This is the branch. So this, even with the name of Serug, um, Arahams, this man who's spoken of, who is 200, exactly 200 years old when it talks about him bringing forth other sons and daughters. His life is fulfilled at 200 years old. And it is related to this branch, his name meaning branch. And on top of that, we see him being, uh, Yeshua being called this branch as being relative to his root, where he comes from, from the root and the offshoot of Jesse. Hallelujah. The branch. The branch. Now we're going to talk about the pictorial equivalent. So the rich has a pictorial equivalent of a man's head. The head of a man. So what is man's head used for? Thinking. Thinking. What else? Leading. Leading. What else? Making decisions. Making decisions. Imagination. How about inventing? All of these things, we, we, we use our, our heads in order to decide upon things. Our head, our mind is like a computer where it holds information. Information goes in and it can come out in many different ways. 
We also, I mean, how many have gotten up in the middle of the night, even though you know your room really well, but have gotten up in the middle of the night and stopped your toe going into the bathroom? Hallelujah, yeah. Yes, that is not a good feeling. So the head also is very important because it holds and it's the main portion of your neuro neurological system, your nerve endings, all the way down at your toe, immediately sends a message to your head, I have been struck, I have been struck, hurt, hurt. And your head says, oh no, pain, pain, pain. So your head does has a, such a great significance in all of these things. So also, this is something that um, I just thought about today. That out of your five senses, only one of them does not happen in your head. And that's touch. All of the rest of them happen in your head. So you've got sight. You've got sight. And we're going to look at this sight. Psalms of uh, 27, starting at 12 and going down to 14. Psalm 27, 12 through 14. Do not give me over to the desire of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out cruelty to me. What if I had not believed to see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. Wait on Yahweh, be strong, and let him strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Yahweh. He gives us sight out of our eyes to be able to see. And here David says, if I would have not, what would have been? I would not have believed if I had not to see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living. He allowed me to see the goodness, his goodness in the land of the living. And then the next one is taste. And then we're going to go to Psalms 34 and 8. Hallelujah. Now we all know this one. Oh, taste and see that Yahweh is good. Blessed is the man that takes refuge in him. Taste sight, taste, hallelujah. Then we're going to go on to hear in Jeremiah 10 and 1. Hear, and he says, hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you, O house of Israel. And in Hebrew, that word is Shema, Shema At. Now this is interesting. Shema At Ha. Hadabah, Hadabar, Shema, At, Alatab, Hadabar. Hear the word which Yahweh speaks to you. And the interesting thing about that, and that's why I read that out in Hebrew, Shema is saying, Shema, you hear, I want you to hear. Then the Alatab doesn't have to be there. It's not the definitive article in this. It is placed, as Rabbi Tu did a teaching concerning the Aleph Tav. It's very interesting, and the more I study the language, the more I am seeing that Aleph Tav in places where it does not have to be. But Father Yahweh puts himself, the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, or right in the middle of that word. Because it has ha the bar. Ha is your definitive article of the bar, which means word. So literally you can say Shema ha the bar. Hear the word. But it says here, Allah top the word. Father Yahweh is very, very um, um, purposed in what he is doing. When he was speaking to those, uh, and speaking to uh, uh, the prophets, and speaking to our father uh, 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 Moshe, and writing and penning the Torah, he put himself 
right in these areas so that we will understand who is speaking and what he is trying to say to us. So that, I thought that was really interesting in Jeremiah. And then we have smell. And we're going to Leviticus, or oh, Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus 30, 34 through 38. And it says, this is smell. And Yahweh said to Moshe, take sweet spices, fragrant gum and cinnamon and galbanum, and clear frankincense with these spices all in equal amounts. Then you shall make of these an incense, a compound work of a perfumer, salted, clean, and set apart. And you shall beat beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the witness in the tent of appointment where I meet with you. It is most set apart to you. And the incense which you make, do not make any for yourself. Remember that. Do not make any for yourself according to its composition. It is set apart to you for who? Yahweh. It's not for you. It's not for you to smell. It's for Yahweh to smell and to receive your offering. Whoever, whatever, uh, whoever makes any like it to smell, it's to smell it, he shall be cut off from his people. Now with all these he tells us how to do what? How to worship him. Through sight, through taste, through hearing, and through smelling. What else do we do with our heads concerning the Torah that the Torah requires us to do? What else? Shema. He calls us to hear. He calls us to intellectually decipher and, would, uh, and then allow our feet to walk it out. Our head is essential part, is an essential part to our body. Would you say that it is? Yeah. I don't know of anybody, you know, you can amputate a whole bunch of stuff. But if you amputate somebody's head, I don't think they're going any further than the uh, uh, obituary and people singing, Nearer my God to thee. So the head is an essential part of our body that we cannot live without. What are all these relevant to? What are all these relevant to? To our relationship with and to the Most High. So let's look at the head from the perspective of him being our race, being our head. So we've got the race. Now there's something beautiful in um, the study of the Hebrew Aleph. Um, you know what? A doesn't mean anything. It's just an A. It's how you, you know, spell something. You use the letters of the alphabet in English to just spell stuff out. They don't really, uh, you know, mean anything. It's just an A. You know, it's just at the beginning. But then, you know, the Hebrew letters have such depth, depth that is just beautiful in studies. Head. So leader and beginning. It is the symbol of choosing between greatness and degradation. Isn't that what we do with our minds every day? We choose whether we want to be happy or we choose whether we want to be sad. We choose whether we want to have a great day or we choose whether we're going to have a bad day. We choose where we decide where we want to, if we want to live a life of, 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 uh, of comfort or whether we want to live a life of discomfort. You know, I used to, I remember I used to always tell my little sisters all the time and my, my uh, husband's little sisters when we would talk. And I said, look, you can live your life and you can make your bed hard, but you'll have to lay in that bed that you made for yourself. Or you can make it nice and cushy and soft to where you are comfortable. But we do that. So this race represents choosing between greatness and its spiritual implication, greatness and degradation. In it, 
is the word for poor. The word poor is rash, which is a rash and a shin. A rash and a shin, man's head, and then El Shaddai, or the teeth, or the, the um, uh, Yahweh, um, it's, you know, that, that word El Shaddai can go either way. Um, if you are a friend of Elohim, who he is fighting for, then it's better for you. But if you are an enemy of his, then he's fighting against you. So um, Yahweh is an equal opportunity employer there. And he says the Resh here and a Shin together is Rosh. But when it is filled with the power of the Aleph, when it is spelled uh, uh, Resh, Aleph, Shin, then it means Rosh. It means head. It becomes the Rosh as in Rosh Kadesh, as in the new moon, the fullness of the new moon, at the head of the month. So now, because you have taken that Aleph that represents the highest, highest form or the, or the first letter of the Aleph the leader of the Aleph the highest form in the, or animal in the sacrificial system, it represents that. You take that Aleph. It also represents, because the, the, I need a, I need a marker. The um, Aleph, as we taught this, when we started, oh my goodness. I left, you have a yod, you have a bab, and then you have another yod. And the yod means hand. Yod, hand. So you've got two hands here. And then you've got a, 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 a kind of elongated, kind of a, a leaning over bob. Now the bob is nail. So you have the two hands and the nail. And that represents our Elohim. Who else had nails pierced? or had his hands pierced, but our Elohim. So you have the Aleph. So when you take that Resh, put the Aleph in the middle, and have the Shin on the side, then you have the Rosh, the head, the first, expressing the firstness and the oneness and the eternity of the Creator and the qualities of being a leader and not a follower, a Resh, is a leader and never a follower. The race is a container. Now this is awesome right here because you've got the race, you've got the bait, the uh, the cough, and the race. All three have the same number equivalent. The only difference is they have zeros behind them. But as I've been going through this olive bet, remember. I've been talking about how it doesn't matter how many zeros you put behind that number, you still have that relevant number as the meaning of your letter. So we have the bait, which is two, the geometric value of two, the kaf, which is 20, geometric value of 20, and now we have the resh, which geometric value is 200. The bait does what? It's a house, so it holds. All three of these are containers. The bait holds the house, too. The kaf is the work. It holds the work of your hands. So when we see in the scripture that the word says, Father, you have planted the world, that you have planted everything, all creation, by the work, by the, uh, well, the work of your hand, by the fullness of your mouth, you have plant, planted the, the foundation of the world. So the cough becomes a container for 
your work. And then we have the resh, which is as uh, is the container, the hand. So it represents containing the infinite, the exponential growth. As we grow, we as we get older, we're supposed to understand more. You know, it, it's I was reading a very interesting um, documentary or watching an interesting documentary. No, I think I read it. Anyway, it was about how children, babies, don't understand depth. But after four, when they're first born and up until a certain amount of time, I can't remember what year of age it is. But that's why a child will walk over to the steps and just step off and fall because they don't see death. They don't see that it is this. First of all, they don't see that it's dangerous. And second of all, they don't see that there is a difference from this height down to the floor. So a child in, in, in their, uh, uh, as they are evolving in their thought processes and getting older, they're having to learn these things. Some things don't come at the time of the birth. So if we have a child that, um, like we'll let, uh, look um, Lemuel, what Lemuel knows right now as a child, if um, Janila was going to, uh, would, didn't know or didn't advance from Lemuel's understanding, that's a problem, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Because now she's at an age where she's supposed to be understanding more. Now she doesn't understand what her mom and dad understand, why? experience. So she doesn't understand about paying bills. She doesn't understand about that there are maybe time restraints on certain things that can cause uh, uh, results in your life that can cause adverse effects. That might not be there yet. Usually that don't come until they get into college and then they realize, uh-oh, nobody's going to wake me up in the morning. Oops. Mom and dad ain't here to wake me up, and I got an eight o'clock class, and I've been late since the first part of the semester. Well, what you have to do? Somebody's gonna have to grow up and start waking themselves up. Mom and dad is not here anymore. These are the stages of life, and that's what this, this race represents this evolving, that there's an exponential growth that's supposed to have happened concerning this range. It also represents the constant transition. There we go. You transition from a child, from Lemuel, on up to Elise, on to Janila, and into uh, uh, um, Adriana, and then on into your adulthood. We just, we see this changing and transitioning that happens, and it's what it's supposed to do. It represents that constant transition, flow and change of life. It is like a constant flow of energy breaking through and breaking down into pieces, building anew. So the race also in this respect we see relates to Messiah as he is called what? The second Adam. He's called the last Adam. He's the one who builds up his brother's house. Why? Because Adam sinned. And because of Adam, one man, all sin came into the world, correct? And because of Yeshua Messiah, what happens? We have life and be hallelujah. So he builds up his brother's house. So there we have the thought of that transitioning and that flow of energy coming out from one area in the beginning, flowing on and making a difference in the end. Hallelujah. That's our Mashiach. Hallelujah. He is the race. So let's go on and we're going to look at this race. We're going to go to Psalms um, in, in relating it to our Messiah. Psalm 33, 6 through 8. 
And it reads, by the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the spirit of his mouth, gathering the waters of the sea together as a heap, laying up the deep in store houses. Let, it, let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. He's our race. Let's look at how this race now relates to our Mashiach, Yeshua. We're going to John 1, 1 through 3. And it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with Elohim, and the word was Elohim. He was in the beginning with Elohim, all came to be through him. And without him, somebody say, you can't live without a head. Without Hallelujah. Without him, not even one came to be that came to be. Hallelujah. Then we're going to go on to, let's look at the top, the reish. Now, the, the letter reish, it has also this understanding of first and beginning, right? So we just went through went through the first and the last. We looked at at the beginning how see how this lines up with Messiah's ministry and it lines up perfect that first and that beginning. We see even with the letter I left lines up with that Rosh, the head of the month. It lines up with our Messiah. So we're going to first look at Romans. Romans 8, 26 through 30. And we're going to see Mashiach is spoken of being the firstborn of many. Brethren, Isaiah 41 and 4, we already read that. Isaiah 46 and 6. Isaiah 48, 12. Revelation 1, 11, 1, 17. Revelation 22, 13. All of them speak to him being, speak of him being the first and the beginning. But now we're going to kind of focus on the top. So we're going to look at these witnesses to establish Mashiach being the literal meaning of the Resh. The first and beginning and looking at this top and see how this part of the literal meaning of the Resh relates to our Mashiach. Now we're going to go, let's look at um, Revelation or uh, Zechariah 4, 8 through 14. Can I get somebody to read that for me nice and loud? Zechariah 4, 8 through 14. Zechariah. And when you get it and you read, read nice and loud. The word of Yahweh came to me saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. And his hands shall complete it. And you shall know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small beginnings? They shall rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of Yahweh, which diligently search throughout the earth. Then I responded and said to him, What are these two olive trees? One at the right of the lampstand and the other at its left. And I responded a second time and said to him, What are these two olive branches which empty golden oil from themselves by means of the gold pipes, two gold pipes? And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my master. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the master of all the earth. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's go on. We're going to go to Matthew 17, 1 through 4. Someone get Matthew 17, 1 through 4 and read it nice and loud for us. Matthew 17, 1 through 4. And after six days, Yahweh took Kepha and Yaakov and Yochanan his brother and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transformed before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as the light. And see Moshe and Elihu appeared to them, talking with him. And people answering said to Yeshua, 
Master, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three booths, one for you and one for Moshe and one for Elihu. Hallelujah. Now someone get for me Revelation 11. Revelation 11. And we're going to tie all these scriptures in concerning Yeshua and the top. We're looking at the top, the head. Revelation 11, 1 through 4. And there was a and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. Mm -hmm. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of Yahuwah and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the other people, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two menorahs standing before the Yah of the earth. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! So what do we see here? Let's look at Matthew 5 and 15. Matthew 5 and 15. Nor do they light a lamp. Now this is what Yeshua says. And put it under a basket. But on a lampstand. And it shines to what? To all those in the what? In the house. In the bay. So Yeshua is also declaring this top. In the high mountains experience. Looking at when in Matthew 17. What happened in Matthew 17? He's up there with also a couple of the other disciples. And what do they see? They see Yeshua begin to all of a sudden glow. His, his, they said his face began to shine and his clothes became white, white, pure white. And then we see who? Two witnesses. We see what? Two of them come and stand on oh, this earth, yes. standing there with him. He was prophesying about Zechariah was prophesying about what happens here in Matthew 17 when they are standing on the mount of, they call it a mount of transfiguration yeah. and these two witnesses come and they stand with him aware on the top of the mountain and then Yeshua speaks out in Matthew 5 and 15 he said you know Yahweh did not create a light or a lamp for it to be put in a basket what did he do but he created it to be a lampstand. And he said, if I am in the world, as long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Is that not what he said? Hallelujah. So he said, you don't put it in a basket. You don't hide the lamb. But Yeshua himself went up to that high place and stood there as the two witnesses came and stood next to him. And they talked. These stood with the Elohim of all the earth. Hallelujah. And he says, so what? What did that do? He said, I went up on the top of that mountain and, and shone bright like a light so that what can happen? And it shines to all those in the bait, in the house of Yaakov, in the house of Jacob. He says, so, see, so sometimes, you know, it's, that's why it's important for us the Torah is so important in the understanding of the Brit Hadashah. Yeah. I know why the church is messed up like it is. Because anytime you take the first half, the whole instructional part of the book, and throw it away, when you're getting your instruction, the, 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 the head, the aleph, the beginning, the rest, you're getting the information from the top. Yes. And it comes down. Yeah. But what they've been doing is using their heads, their rish. They've been using their minds and going according to their own understanding. And that's why it's not working. That's why it's not working. Yeshua was proclaiming from the top of the mountain that he is the lampstand that shines to all the house of Israel. Then we see throughout John, starting in the first chapter, Continuing on, continuing all the way down to the 12th chapter, Messiah re refers to himself as the light. 
the light of the world. He charges us too within those scriptures to as his Talmudim to be light also. Why? So that we can give light to the whole house of Israel. That's our charge, to be a light to the nations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's look at our final witness to Yeshua being our race. And we're going to um, just talk about, let me bring first, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. And it says that I wish you to know that the head of every man is Messiah. And the head of woman is the man. And the head of Messiah is who? Elohim. Then he, let's go on and we're going to read now Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And it says, and he himself gave some as emissaries, as prophets, as evangelists, some as evangelists, some as shepherds, some as teachers or rabbis. That's still the same word, teachers. For the perfecting of the set apart ones to the work of the service to a doing what? Building up of the body of Messiah. That's that bank. That's that container that Yeshua is building up. That number two, that container, that bank. Until we all come to unity, this is the goal. To come to the unity of the belief of the knowledge of the Son of Elohim to a perfect man to the measure of the statue of the completeness of Elohim so that we should no longer be children tossed and, 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 and born about for by every wind of teaching by the trickery of man in cleverness. Is that not what's happening now? Yes. Why? Because man is using his own head. He's his head. Opposed to Yeshua being his head. He goes on to say, by uh, tossed to and fro, tossed and borne about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of man and cleverness. Cleverness, Yeshua says. This is craftiness. Where else do we hear of something being crafty? In the garden. Craftiness of what? Leading astray. But maintaining the truth in love. We grow up. We grow up. There's that transition of that race. Transitioning from a child on up to adulthood. The transitioning and the transforming of that energy and that light transforming itself into that great light. Hallelujah. We're light. We're little lights, but you better believe it. He is the great light. Hallelujah. We grow up in all respects into him who is the what? Head. Messiah. From whom the entire body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies according to the working by which each part does share causes growth of the body. Y'all hear this? Yes. It causes growth. All of these things, the emissaries, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, all of this, according is, 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 is according to the working by which each part does share, causes growth of the body for the building up of itself. The building up of that bait, of that house in love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Absolutely. That's why we are, our, our gifts are given. And that's why Yeshua said, Yahweh says, the gifts are not given, they're given without repentance. Father Yahweh not going to repent for the gifts that he gave. Because the gifts are for what? That house. The house that he is building. The house that Yeshua came to build up and make right before his uh, the, our Elohim. Then he goes on. With, let's look at Jeremiah 29 and 11. And I know everybody knows this. Jeremiah 29 and 11. 
For I know the plans I am planning for you, declares Yahweh. Plans of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and expectancy. So if we are to expect, if we expect anything, we should expect peace and a future. Not evil. The word for no in this scripture, when he says, I know the plan that I have for you, the word no is yada. And it's Brown Driver's Briggs, and you've heard us teach on that word and use that word before, yada. Brown Driver's Briggs um, um, Dictionary, and also Strong's H3045. And it means to know, to learn to know, to perceive, to see. There's that seeing. Oh, that I had not had not known that I was going to, uh, other than seeing uh, Yahweh's goodness in the land, seeing his goodness in the land of the living, to see, to find out, to discern, to discriminate to distinguish, to know by experience, to recognize, to admit, to acknowledge, to confess, to be wise and revealed. This is what Yahweh is saying when he says, I know the plan that I have for you. That I recognize, I, I know this by experience. I, I, I know this, I distinguish, I discern, I, I have seen it, I perceive it. I, it's all of that. And it will be revealed, what? Through my wisdom, through his wisdom, that every word that comes out of his mouth is true. So if he says, I know the plan that I have for you, now this, I know the plan I am planning for you. And the word plan here is makashabeth, makashabeth, which means imagination, invented. It means purpose and thought. But the root word of that word is, hmm, the root word of that word is, means to compute or devise. It means to compute or devise. So finally, we go to Proverbs 3 and 1. He says, my son, Proverbs 3 and 1, and I'm going to read down to 7. And it says, my son, do not forget my Torah. Now we can stop right there. My son, do not forget my Torah and let your heart watch over my commands for length of days and long life and peace they add to you. Yes. Explain to me how that could be bad. Yes. For length of days and long life and peace they add to you. Let not loving commitment and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the table of your heart. Thus finding favor and good sight, insight in the eyes of Elohim and man. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Hallelujah. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. Lean not to your own understanding. Hallelujah. Know Yada, him in all your ways. Hallelujah. And he makes all your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. Now I brought this, I pulled this up in Hebrew right here and I'm going to just look at that That um, it's ki anuk uh, anoki yada yadati alatav which doesn't need to be there either ha uh, 
me ma maka shebe so here we have right here too the olive tab now there's no reason where it says for i know the plan key means of uh, like therefore which like, is the plan the plan but out of time there it is right in the middle of that too i know the plan yahweh has the plan and he knows the plan that he has for us and in that plan he put himself right in the middle of it the aleph and the tav so let's let's finish up he says uh, my son, this is Proverbs 3, 1 through 7. Do not forget my Torah. And let your heart watch over my commands for length of days and long life. Peace they add to you. Let not loving commitment and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the table of your heart. Thus finding favor and good sight in the eyes of Elohim and man. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. Know him in all your ways, and he makes all your paths straight. Now let's read this part all together in red. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. So now, if we look finally, Yeshua, our head, the leader and beginning. He is the symbol of choosing between greatness and degradation. He is our, our left in the midst of the rosh, in the midst of our poverty. He is our left. He is our head, expressing and uh, expressing the firstness, the oneness, and the eternity of the Creator, and qualifying Him as our leader. After this teaching. When we think from now on, we follow his head. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We follow his lead yes. and not our own. Hallelujah. Yeshua, our all understanding, all knowing, all desiring, Resh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.